not posted. <laughs> but I will report you. No. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, and now uh, I'll share screen. So, Catherine, are you seeing slides? That you're the only one. Yeah, I am. Okay. So we're in. So, um, this is, I guess, the third in our spring series on LLMs. So we started off with basic foundations, um, and then two weeks ago we had Kevin talking about how he's using them um, for creating tools to provide commentary to esports games. Um, but all of this was trying to lead up to a discussion around how do we think about trustworthy and other ethical topics with AI in terms of when we're using them, not just as consumers, but like fine tuning, adding content, creating tools using LLMs. Um, and so to lead that discussion is PhD student who is studying trustworthy AI. Um, so I guess you can introduce yourself and tell more about what you do and where, and then we can jump into discussion. Just tell me when you want to yeah. forward slides. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Leigh Kaplan. I'm a PhD candidate in the systems engineering department. And I'm also a fellow with GW's designing trustworthy, co-designing trustworthy AI uh, program. So that's a combination between systems engineering and computer science. Uh, and so I am not a computer science expert. I'm going to also add that as a disclaimer. Um, I'm going to share some technical information uh, that a paper about, from a paper that I read, um, but like, feel free to correct me or, you know, jump in, add other information that you know uh, to further enrich our discussion. Um, but I do spend a lot of time thinking about and having discussions about uh, trustworthy AI and what does that mean and what does that look like? Um, and I, I care a lot about how we think about ethics and the design of technology and in particular different AI technologies. So uh, I'm gonna share a little bit, uh, maybe spend 10-ish minutes uh, talking through some of uh, these technical pieces, and then I'm really hoping to just have a discussion with you all. Um, and maybe like also to level set, are people like working on language models? How much technical information are you all coming in with? What are your backgrounds and experiences with this topic? I've never worked with them. Okay. I haven't either. All right. Well, yeah. I'm a heavy user, late developer. So. Yeah. Great. Uh, we'll go to the next step. So I also wanted to level set by talking about how relevant and timely this is. This was yep. the New York Times Daily episode from this morning. Um, <laughs> so I listened to it uh, as I had breakfast. And it is talking about Google's um, new chatbot, Gemini, and uh, really a lot of debate about the outputs that that chatbot was creating. Um, and so, well, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but, you know, it's this is something that's happening all around us. It's something in the technologies that we're using. Um, and uh, also to say that there aren't great answers. Um, people are really wrestling with these questions. And, you know, when you have a giant tech company like Google that is being publicly criticized or questioned for these topics, uh, then that's a good signal that this is hard stuff to do. <clears throat> so, like I said, kind of my goals for our discussion today are one, to learn a little bit uh, at a pretty high level about some technical strategies that uh, researchers and practitioners are developing to try and improve the reliability of foundation models. So these are those kind of really general models that can be applied in a lot of different use cases. Um, and you know we're mostly focused on these language models. That's kind of what we've been talking about the past few weeks. You can also have some of these image generation um, or image identification models as well. And then 
Um, after we've got a little bit more technical uh, understanding, you know, I also want us to then zoom out and think about these values, our personal values that might be embedded in, um, in these design decisions. So this topic, or uh, the, the talk was thinking about alignment and trustworthiness. So let's also kind of define those um, because those can have pretty different definitions um, between, depending on who you're talking to. So in an IBM blog post about alignment, the author is describing alignment as this process of encoding human values and goals. And I thought that was really interesting that the author calls out that, that piece that, you know, we're acknowledging, we're putting values into these models um, to make them as helpful, safe, and reliable as possible. Through alignment, enterprises can tailor AI models to follow their business rules and policies. So this process is often involved when you're taking one of those really general models and you're trying to apply it to your use case. You're doing this alignment process to try and make it fit for that use case um, and have the types of outputs that you are wanting and expecting. The next key term is what is trustworthiness? And I'll say that in the trustworthy AI group, we have a lot of debates about what this term means um, and trust and differences between trust and trustworthiness. Uh, it's a very complicated term. Uh, I am choosing today to use a definition related to a work from the National Institutes of Standard and Technology, so a federal agency in the US. Um, they created, they wrote this report about um, this risk management framework. Uh, and in that framework, they describe the characteristics of a trustworthy system. So this is kind of what you might think of as these little different pieces that might all lead to trustworthiness. So they want it to be valid and reliable, safe, secure and resilient, accountable and transparent, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in the framework, they have this figure that they use to kind of show how these pieces relate to each other, at least how they define them. So in the report, they're saying valid and reliable is on bottom because it is the bedrock. You need to have a valid and reliable system um, for it to be trustworthy. And then you need to also have these other pieces. And what I also like about that framework and what I think it's helpful to kind of break down trustworthiness into these different pieces is you can start to think about cases where there might be trade-offs between these different characteristics. So, I mean, I think the two right next to each other, explainable and interpretable and privacy enhanced. Often when you make things more open, then, you know, you might be risking privacy or you might be risking security. Um, like if you publish your code, then maybe people can look and see different ways to attack that code. Um, and so I think it is once again, valuable to think about, you know, this umbrella term of trustworthiness can only get us so far. We really have to start digging into these different pieces. Okay. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. Now we're gonna talk through very briefly some technical strategies for improving reliability. So uh, there was this recent paper that Ryan actually shared with me um, where they were kind of talking about through these general types of approaches that people are using to try to make models, these models more reliable. And you know, once again, we think about that risk management framework Reliability is just one piece of that, but it's a very important piece. So it's useful to think about how we can um, make these models more re reliable. And they think about it once again in a specific context. Um, so you really have to think about using these models in context. Uh, so if it's a medical context or the banking context, uh, you're going to have different requirements that you need to meet. Um, and they're thinking about reliability based on, you know, these different attributes, how effective those interactions are with that user, things about biasness, 
adversarial robustness, meaning like how susceptible is it to being attacked? Um, and then failure controllability. How is it go? How might it fail? How are you going to control those failures? Slide. Um, this is a figure that they put in the paper. I'm not going to talk through it. It's a lot of details, which I think, you know, just going to show. Um, researchers are working on a lot of different methods. And uh, so if you are interested, if that's something maybe that you might want to work on in the future or look into, um, I'm going to, I can share these slides. The paper is linked. You can go and read about these different methods, um, but I'm not going to talk through them. But they do have kind of these four main categories that they lay out. Um, so debiasing and prompt refinement, failure assessment, and adversarial robustification, as they talk about it. Um, and also one thing that this figure is highlighting is you can think about this as the process of making a model. So you're also going to have more on the data side and the data that is going into your model. How are people prompting it? How are they interacting with that model? You're going to have your embeddings. So um, in his, in our talk, we're learning a little bit about the large language models. You know, we learned about like these embeddings are also a part of how that model is designed. There are a bunch of different foundation models from all these different companies that all have different pieces uh, that went into building that model. Um, and then you're going to have some more about how it's calibrated to finally get you to your output. So these different methods relate to different parts of that process of designing that model. Bias is often discussed as a huge concern when we're thinking about model outputs. Is that model going to perform differently for different classes of people? Um, especially protected classes, different genders, different races, different religions, etc. Um, and so in the paper, they highlight detection as you know one strategy you need to be actively looking for these things, testing them, um, and you can do that by creating certain evaluation data sets. And then in order to counteract that bias, you can, use two processes. You can think about augmentation, which means adding in more data. If you don't have a lot of data on one group, then you can add in more data, maybe by using another data set. Um, and also there are um, a lot of people who are now working on using synth synthetic data. So using models to create more data to train the, the model. Um, and that can also have its own challenges with amplifying bias sometimes. Um, so you have to be very thoughtful about how you do that. And then adjustment is really that broad category for thinking about playing around with these model weights and these actual training pieces. I also wanted to call out a note on missing data um, because I really think that it's easy to say, oh, we don't have a lot of data on this on this group, um, but there are a lot of scholars who think about missing data as a reflection of our societal values, that what we choose to measure is a statement of what we value. Um, and so while I think synthetic data is, you know, a popular strategy and is a very useful strategy in some ways, I think it's also important to consider what does it look like if we actually want to like go out and collect that data and how might that data that you go out and you put in that time and effort to collect, how might that be more valuable? Um, but also, you know, are there groups that don't want their data collected because they are concerned about harms to their groups? So, you know, really thinking about and reflecting on that bigger question of why that data is missing, I think is also a really important piece. And then there are always people who are going to be bad actors in your system. Um, and so this kind of term, adversarial robustification, um, <laughs> which is a very technical term, uh, people are going to attack your model, basically. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you can, with as with like a lot of systems, you can design special tests where you're trying to make it break. You can hire people to do that. 
Um, there's a term called red teaming where you're bringing in people to attack and look for weaknesses. So that's a common approach as well. And then in terms of other ways that you should be evaluating and thinking about your model, you're looking for detection of common problems. We already talked about bias as a problem. Hallucination is the term that people are using to mean that it's making up facts. It's not actual reality. It's saying something that isn't true, um, which I've also heard people critique use of that term, um, that the model isn't really hallucinating. These are predictive models. I guess, are we, maybe I should have backed up. Are we familiar with how these models produce outputs? Okay. And then, you know, it's see, making this See video from two weeks ago. Or, I guess, yeah. I guess see, a month ago now. See video. From, sessions ago. Uh, we had a whole prior video. Yeah. Uh, Grady's talk. Um, so, you know, that's how it works. It's going to like have this uncertainty around it. Um, and then in uncertainty, um, you can also think about that as concept drift. You know, these models are learning. Um, and so it, over time, based on taking in new data, it might start producing different outputs and maybe you don't like what those outputs look like. Um, so you can perform different evaluation measures um, to check for these different uh, types of desired outputs, robustness, fairness, harmlessness, calibration, and then verification is, you know, a specific term that they use when you're trying to have output, certain types of outputs. So if you're trying to get it to do mathematical calculations, um, that's hard to do when you have this kind of next word prediction. Um, and so you can kind of build in other pieces to how that model is going to take in that input and then generate that output. So that's all the technical information I'm gonna present. Um, and really, you know, to kick off our discussion, I want to um, circle back and say, okay, we're doing all this great work. We're like thinking of these different ways to test our models and see how they're not working um, and then tweak them. But, you know, are these technical strategies going to be enough um, because this slide. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'm almost done. Um, so once again, you know, if we go back and we think about um, the, the case of Google's Gemini model. So this is a headline about that model. And to provide a little bit more information, um, when Google first released the Gemini model, they noticed things like, the model would only produce images of like white people. Um, and, you know, some of these common biases of bias in the data set, if you ask it, oh, like describe a CEO, it's going to describe a white male. Um, and so Google had tried to combat this um, and employ perhaps a number of those technical strategies to. Um, to increase diversity in those outputs. But now people are noticing, hey, now Gemini cannot, like will never create an image of a white person. And now you have all these weird combinations where you're getting black Nazis and, and a woman Pope, like which are the things that like factually do not exist at present or ever. Um, and so I really liked the, the tagline um, underneath this is it's not just suffering from a technical problem, but a philosophical problem. Um, there's a lot of critiquing, like if Google as a company has decided it wants to have this value of increasing diversity, increasing representation, um, is that a good goal? Who gets to decide whether that should be how these model outputs should perform in the end? Um, and so, that's, you know, some, some food for thought. So these are some discussion questions that I outlined, but I'm also happy to just let us discuss what we, what's coming to mind if anyone has um, any initial reactions, thoughts. I, I found it so surprising that Google's having this problem because 
Dali had this two years ago, like two whole years ago. I, I, don't, I don't know if you remember, I, I went to a talk and you were there too. It was one of those AI seminars and Dali's hack solution at the time, it was like Dali, I think it was still the first one maybe, or maybe Dali too, was to just put the word black at the end of the sentence, like inject a word like that or mm -hmm. woman or female or something, just in individual words to make it more diverse. And so people would put the prompt, uh, show a picture of a man holding a sign that says, and then the picture would be a man holding a sign that says black, <laughs> because that's how you, that, I mean, that's how you would learn what, what it was injecting outside of your prompt. And so there was all these pictures all over Reddit going around that was like people holding a sign says woman and holding black or diverse or whatever. And it was just, it was like, okay, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is not a sufficient solution to the problem and you're automatically injecting prompts that we didn't want. And here we are two years later and Google's now like basically having the same problem. Maybe not so simple, but like, I'm like, where have they been for two years? Like this isn't, this, Dolly seems to have somehow got around this to some degree, like, or they don't have as, as many issues it seems, but I'm, I'm, to me, this was more of an indicator of like, oh, they're that far behind still, like they're behind the curve on where AI development is. So whatever they're using is just not the appropriate approach, but it, it seems like others have somewhat worked this out or at least much better than it used to be. It's you're getting more diverse outputs, but also appropriately. So like, they're not just diverse for the diversity's sake. There's context there and I seem to figure this out. So I'd like to call out an assumption in what you just stated, um, because I think it gets to this question mm -hmm. of, you know, some people would argue, should we even have diversity as a goal? Like that is a stated value saying yeah. these outputs should be more diverse. Um, do we think that tech companies should make that decision? Do, is that a valid type of goal for a company to set or who should get to decide what types of values go into a model? Well, and I think that gets to the challenge too of like my understanding there is a model trained on like everything in the dark web and all the porn sites and everything else, they just dumped everything in and it's completely unfiltered. And do we want that? Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like, I don't really want Google making the decision, but I don't want that either. But someone might want that. So should it exist for the person who does? Well, in the US, we have laws about certain aspects that there are illegal things out there. But if it was just the legal stuff, should that exist for people who do want that? Just like if someone wants a Google that's going to make all these images that look that that are black Nazis and female popes, then let them have a model. Let the market decide. It's kind of another approach to the ethics of it is that people decide. Yeah, you. I mean, just you could imagine a a yeah. Let let the user decide option that just says click these boxes. Like I want more diverse solutions, and then. Okay, we'll turn on the more diverse model for you. Uh, maybe you do. Maybe you're making a satire and you want black Nazis. I don't know. And you want a picture of that because you're making something satirical. Um, and you you want that image, and that's actually a really hard image to find historically. So you want to generate one. But yeah, I think this the the should the should the large tech company that's making a public product that I I guess it also gets down to this question of trust. Like we tend to trust Google with most of our everything like we give it our location and our emails and our bank account information i mean like google has all this data about us so this is a trusty company and what's the what's the level of in this world like what what should those models be able to do uh do we want them making those kinds of decisions i don't know um that's different from like you're saying like just a individual developer who just says i'm going to make a model that can do anything i want because it's open source and you can use it or not i don't care yeah. i'd like to hear from some yeah. folks who have, <laughs> have as much experience should this be in the context of the industry as in uh in employment the u.s employment laws are different as in the 80 20 rule if you're following that then you're not doing discrimination but for uh giving out loans the rules are different and their uh, consumer lending the rules are different so so the probably the context of diversity in each of these models will have to be calibrated based on the existing laws or envisioned laws there. 
Okay, so thinking about yeah. the laws within yeah. each context. Because they're yeah. very different. Mm -hmm. Do you have an, a, another thought? Yeah, I think it's what you mentioned, like, encoding, encoding the user to make it more, like, more what he wants exactly out of it. And, like, we're always going to have problems with models because it's not a straightforward way. So if, if the user has check boxes and like now now in DALI 2, they give a lot more options and in like DALI, not DALI 3 in chat GPT, they give a lot more options like what do you want? And like we see the injected, uh, it, like, the yeah, yeah, it gives the new prompt. When we select those check boxes, like what kind of image do we want? Then it injects right there in the prompt that we type in. So. So you're starting to see some of these models have these different unique it's not about control the features. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I had not seen Yeah. So for this problem also, they can be similar. Uh, yeah, and I think that is definitely an approach that people are talking about. Um, and for something really general, like a general image generator or a chat, a very general chat bot, then it might be the way that companies keep going uh, or an approach that they choose to take. Um, one critique of that um, approach is that, you know, you'll, you'll continue to see people use their preferences and get really different outputs and um, kind of have this, this splitting. Um, I don't think that is unique to this situation um, in that, you know, we have a similar type of problem with content moderation. If you think about that as an example, and there are certain platforms that people choose to use, uh, to Ryan's point, that have very little content moderation, and it's pretty much anything goes. Um, and so users then decide to opt into engaging with that platform versus engaging with uh, platforms where they know there's going to be some type of content moderation um, because they like how that ends up creating a community. Uh, you know, there is a challenge of that there are still only a certain number of platforms, a certain number of, uh, you know, things to choose from. And so can, there's a lot of debate about that, but um, it's definitely, yeah, an approach that um, I think, yeah, like you're saying, it's already out there. But it's also a very American approach. Mm -hmm. Europeans are not in favor of let the market figure it out. They're more socialist. They want the government to, and that's what the AI app is going to do. It's going to let the government and the lawyers figure out what people should have access to and not have access to. I have comments for that because, well, as, sorry, as ChatGPT comes up, they kind of, uh, open source to some Chinese AI companies. And we do Chinese versions of the, uh, like the GPT. And so uh, right now, there were like just so many limitations. Like um, that AI does not answer a lot of kind of sensitive or critical questions because of like the government is writing the rules and to, to limit the capability of the, of the AI. So there is always a pros and cons and uh, one thing that I like to hear about is that it enables you to write about yourself. Like it gives you a blank page of introducing yourself so that every time you open a new channel chat to be um you won't need to to introduce who you are, what you're doing, <clears throat> and all the basic information. You can just store that there. And every time uh, every time I ask questions, GPT will reply, well, Pain Fine, this is my name. <clears throat> Hi, Pain Fine, this is the solution. So he, it knows that my name is Ping Fun and um, the tool I'm using is, is R coding and with R Studio. I'm writing photo and I'm doing the marketing research, like everything it knows. So that the the result will be biased to my preference. So that's kind of a, like personalization for every individual. But uh, the thing is, I just wrote a prompt to GPT, to Dali, that get me a picture of a successful entrepreneur. So it gives me this, seemingly to be a successful young, maybe it's white guy, so that um, 
my explanation for this is that look at looks like this <laughs> is that um our LMs they function based on history, based on whatever we said on the internet, and we said a lot. So based on human history, a typical uh, successful entrepreneur will be somebody like the young Bill Gates, young Steve Jobs, or 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 Mark Zuckerberg. So these guys are all white men, and they were successful when they were very young, including Elon Elon Musk. So um, I am not surprised by this, even though even though I'm not white and. I accept this because it's what happened. But I can give the preference to the prompt saying that, well, uh, I want more diversity. Give me a um, like give me a successful entrepreneur. Maybe I can get something else that I haven't tested yet. So I think there are pros and cons and uh, there are kind of solutions. And also one good solution is why not make a common joint survey to the market. Yes. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. That's a research method yeah. uh, that we use in our research group a lot. Um, yeah. And I, so, you know, we, I think even as you decide to, to give user controls, like there's a lot of leeway in that, right? Where you're like, okay, can you press a check button? Can you, um, can you encourage someone to uh, to go in and say, hey, do you want to like increase the diversity of your results? Um, once again, kind of thinking about content moderation, a solution that some companies have is to say, this looks fraudulent, uh, maybe double check this information versus blocking it outright. So those are yeah, individual decisions um, that, that these companies are, are having to make and wrestle with, um, that there's still a lot of decisions to make even within that, that one sub-decision. Actually, to, to go on a little bit of a tangent on, on that point, um, so I'm coming from the medical school, and a lot of our applications actually um, we're not really even concerned with things like human values because we're still at the stage where we don't trust the validity of the model's results. Right. And so kind of do we I mean, this is an important question for kind of consumer facing models, but in our industry where we need a kind of if a doctor is going to trust the summary of a chart that, you know, chat GPT generated, it needs to be accurate 99.999% of the time. Right. Are we at that stage or ever going to really get to that stage so we can start having those discussions for industry specific applications? Do you imagine it being like it said the, the patient took 50 milligrams of something and it was actually five. And all of a sudden uh, you could die. I mean, just from being off on some basic, really small, and it doesn't do math very well. So um, that's one that's, do you trust it or not kind of question is, is kind of key. I, th this is related to this question of diversity because I think I think the, the frustration with it is what is the default setting? Like what's the, what should it give you on your first, shot requests and uh we want these things to be accurate we want them to be cor like correct so if i'm like show me a picture of a can of coke and it shows me a pepsi i'm like that's wrong i asked for coke i don't trust this thing if it shows me a coke every time i'm like okay good it's it's, it's correct so then when i say successful businessman generically or business person generically and i get a white man if we're frustrated by that because we're like well that's not what I had in mind. I was envisioning someone else, maybe a woman. And then I have to specifically ask for a successful woman to get that picture. That's frustrating because we're like, well, that's, it's, it's, uh, it's not what I wanted. Um, but then it gets back to like Nifan's question about like, well, how was it trained? And it's trained on the fact that 99% of the CEOs are white men. And so it's giving you its best guess, which is probably a white man. And you have to ask for something else if if you You're want something for inaccuracy. Yeah, it's trying to be yeah, accurate, that. which is frustrating. That like that's where it clashes, I think. And and the same exact problem is if you translate it over to this situation with medical, it has nothing to do with like social values or any of this. It's just like it has to be accurate. It, if it's wrong, that you're giving me the wrong medicine, or you're going to give the wrong diagnosis for this patient. This is like terribly wrong. Um, so. We want it to be accurate, uh, but we also want it to maybe somehow uh, display our social values. And 
that's that last bit is somewhat I feel like impossible because everyone has their own social value, right? So the people who are sort of anti DEI are the ones posting these images of like black Nazis. They're they're like this is so frustrating. This thing is totally useless because it's over in it's been co opted by the the woke community or whatever. Like that's the narrative that they're frustrated by. At the same time, the people who aren't white men might be frustrated by the fact that it just produces white men all the time and nothing else. Um, I think if, like, if if we want it to be accurate, that's one. That's that's a, a sort of a fundamental task. Should we want it to reflect social values? Is a whole separate question of well, what's your social value? Your values are your your own. And that's really hard to engineer. So I think that's where this is all getting. But there's also a value good. to accuracy because doctors aren't. 99.9%. Yeah. Doctors mess up all the time, yeah, right? yeah. daily, not just every now and again. Yeah. It's a big problem. So we're actually asking it for it to be better than human in some contexts, yeah. which is a really hard thing. So I like the idea of thinking about a specific context like yeah. medicine. So like maybe let's think about that a little bit more um, and kind of get out of the world of these general purpose models that users are using and thinking about a model that a physician uh, or a different medical practitioner might use. Um, because one, you can think that like that patient isn't probably getting a lot of choice about what hospital they go to. So I think it's a use case for that. But I think it's also, you know, accuracy is one thing, but there's still going to be values that each individual physician or nurse might have. How much pain should someone get to tolerate before getting prescribed opioids? Um, and what's their risk tolerance for that? Um, so, or maybe you could share other kinds of values trade-offs that um, you're, you're thinking about in your field um, where that might translate into it's, you know, accurate for this pain, you know, a pain setting of five gets this amount of medicine or whatnot, but making that connection is going to be a decision that you have to program into the model. Yeah, I mean, we definitely are very far away from trusting models to do any kind of medical decision making. <laughs> um, but even for like really simple use cases. So let's say, you know, you leave the hospital, you get a summary of all of the care that you got in the hospital. And at the end of it, it says you should go talk to your cardiologist because you, you know, you came in for a heart thing. Um, the cardiologist doesn't want to read 20 pages of everything that happened to you in the hospital. The cardiologist wants like a paragraph saying, this is why they came. This is probably what was done. This is why they need you, right? Um, and so there, on one hand, there is value, right? A cardiologist will want a slightly different summary than a primary care doctor, than your physical therapist, than your orthopedic surgeon, than everybody else. But on the other hand, the cardiologists, even understanding that that discharge summary, you know, 1% of the time is going to be wrong in some way because somebody copy pasted the wrong thing, mm -hmm. um, is still going to go for the discharge summary instead of the one paragraph summary because they just don't trust that that one paragraph is accurately representative of the discharge summary in, you know, any robust uh, percentage of the time. I guess Google kind of has an incentive to not really delve into medical diagnoses or whatnot because it could generate controversy. And then like advertisers might pull out and I kind of wonder how many users might be like more interested in like another model that doesn't really have these restrictions in that same vein. And I don't know, <laughs> this looks like the thought. Can you uh, explain what you mean by some other model, like a model of like a, a model different company without, or? Like a model without these like restrictions, like it's able to generate these um, female folks or whatever. Mm. I wonder like if that would attract more, I guess, traffic, more people would be interested in something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is a good point. I mean, I think there's a discussion. Well, the models from these big companies, they benefit from having so much data, but you're having to sign up for these that trade offs. So, right. yeah. Well, and with the legal thing, there was the case a couple of weeks ago where Air Canada got sued because their chatbot gave misinformation about the yeah. warrant, like how long you could change and get your money back. And in Canada, they won. Now, nothing like that's come up in the US courts, but it'll be country specific, like who is protected from what. But here's the other scary thing is that right now there are 
large physician groups that are using ChatGPT to answer patient questions. Mm -hmm. And on one hand, yeah, there was a couple of pretty bad studies showing that um, that there are a lot that ChatGPT is a lot more compassionate than a human doctor in answering his patient questions. Um, but on the other hand, what happens when they give the wrong advice and the physician hasn't double checked because it's an automated process, right? Where do we, um, we we're, we're going for values, right? Because we want our doctors to be compassionate and to listen to us and to make time even when they don't have time, right? But now we're getting into the accuracy side of things and when is the next lawsuit going to happen because the doctor said, take the wrong medication or stop your medication and it wasn't the doctor. I like your point about expectations. Like, what are we expecting um, from our provider or, or you know whoever might be using that? And it, yeah, it's the expectations we have of them. It's the expectations that that person who is using the the user of the model, the direct user, has of that model and its benefits and drawbacks. You know, one could criticize and say, if you're an expert. And you know that these models have these flaws, then you shouldn't be using them in that context, or you should do more due diligence. Um, and that's where you can get into the liability question, I think, um, as well. Well, and with the expectation, are we expecting something that's unrealistic? So I had a cousin three weeks ago who went to the hospital with pneumonia. They released him on Tuesday. He died on Wednesday night. Clearly, the doctors messed up by sending him home. No lawsuits or anything. I mean, there's nothing to lawsuit. There's no autopsy or anything in a case like this. But clearly, maybe if it is 95% right, it's still 5% better than the human doctors. Because we know the human doctors aren't 100. They're probably 90. Yeah. If it's better than that, is it already good enough to be released? But that's a value statement to me. If we're waiting for a hundred, it'll never happen probably. But is it better to give people something that's 95% good and it's freely available to the world? Or is it better to rely on human doctors, which you can see is a limited number and still mess up one out of every 10 times? And I'm not sure if it's one of those, but so that's the ethical Wouldn't that be a trade-off on accuracy versus reliability, right? It, it could be accurate and Again, say 98% of the cases, but with it reliable, but it'd be always accurate. What if, as you mentioned, wrong uh, stop, wrong instruction of stopping a medicine? Is, is that acceptable that 2% of the cases are an acceptable loss? And who defines that? That 2% is the machine gives an uh, incorrect answer for, let's say, X percent, and the X percent loss is acceptable, no matter what the disastrous effect of that would be. But because the bias could come into play for, for that factor, right? I mean, even because we're talking about medical cases, different populations react differently to certain medicines. Indians are predisposed to diabetes and, and certain things like a certain lifestyle disease or certain genetic diseases. Different populations could have that. So the advice given based on a larger study, larger population could not work for that subgroup or population. So it's accurate, but... For that subgroup, it's not. So again, for a large population, it's good, but it's really for others, it might not be. I think there will never be one model fits all, right? There will be like, different, different models for different So So how, how many different models? Then there comes the uh, question, do you have a, you put in your criteria and it takes in every information set and then spits out a value for you. With too many options, too, too many problems. To... Well, also, the more models you have, the more of a headache it becomes to make sure each one of them is reliable. Maybe, maybe you don't get enough data. Maybe there's also a question of who should be having access to the models. Like, maybe only doctors should have access to the medical, like, kind of diagnoses kind of related to LLMs. I'm thinking, I'm not too sure. I, I heard the opposite. I mean, I've certainly, whether they're truthful or not, seen plenty of examples on. Reddit, Twitter, right? So can't say your sources here, but people saying, I asked my doctor this and I went to another doctor and asked them again. Everyone ignored me. I asked ChatGPT and it turns out I had X and I almost died. I like they had an appendicitis or something. And the doctors all said it was a stomach ache. And I went in and they said, oh yeah, your appendix is about to rupture. Um, and so like without, they were like, ChatGPT saved my life, literally, because it, I described, I said, it was the only thing that listened to me. 
so, I mean, this is an issue with our medical system that people are overworked and there's not enough time and people often miss things because of that. And they systematically miss things, right? There's, there's, there's systematic racism in this, not any one individual position perhaps, but like institutions can like and access and all these things. So there's like, we know that the mortality rate for black mothers is much higher than white women in, in childbearing, right? Why is that in this country? Like why? It makes no sense why this should even exist, but it's it's there, it's, it's, it's in the numbers. So having a system that's like pretty accurate most of the time, maybe that's actually helping those communities who are otherwise not getting access because they're not being listened to, right? They have access to something and then they can take that with them to a doctor or a hospital maybe and say, well, I've, I've learned this, or at least this is what it's telling me. What do you think? Um, I don't know. Like, it, it's not, not necessarily bad. Um, there's at least edge cases where you can think of where it could probably do better than a doctor, or at least the, the effect that it's accessible changes a lot of things. I like that part, the, this kind of discussion we're having about access yeah. and the trade-offs with access. Um, on the one hand, if you restrict access, then you could perhaps raise the expectations for those that get that access, saying, you know, I'm not taking this general model. This is a model in a specific medical context. It these have been, it has been checked in all of these different ways. I can verify that it has this level of accuracy mm -hmm. um, versus using just out of the box chat. I would say that <laughs> like physicians using chat chat, chat GPT out of the box um, is pretty unethical it's, given it's that it doesn't have these different yeah. um, checks in that context. <clears throat> but I think, you know, on the other hand, JP's point about, um, you know, access and restricting access then limits power and, and who can, and if it, if having broader access also gives people more power and, and helps them reach better medical decisions, then is that the right course? Is that the ethical option? Um, I, it, I, I don't think it's an easy question to answer. Um, I'll say that there's, it's not like we're not already doing this. I mean, there's WebMD and this is like the bane of every physician is like this patient coming in being like, well, I printed this off of WebMD and they're like, oh God, please. You self-diagnosed and, and it's like the worst thing there that like, most of the time, or maybe I don't know if most or not, a lot of the times maybe it's wrong. And so it's just frustrating, but people already do this. People already seek out help online because they can't get access. And, and so they come in only after they've done a little bit of searching and think that this might be something serious. So now I'm gonna come in. Um, and so this is yet another form of that where it's an AI that's trying to diagnose you. I guess the danger here is that it feels like a person talking to you, like the experience of talking with this thing feels like I'm talking with a doctor maybe. So maybe I'm more willing to trust it, but maybe I shouldn't, you know, I don't know. And at least for right now, people probably aren't using some specialized one. They're probably just using ChatGPT because that's the one I've heard of. And so they're asking, you know, I have stomach pain and they're just asking this thing, what should I do? And uh, for now, I think a lot of the times they just said, you should go ask your doctor, <laughs> which is like a good response if that's what the general purpose AI is doing. Um, but, but yeah, we're, I mean, that I, this is, this is already happening. And so this is, this is another form of it. Um, I mean, maybe a less consequential outcome, but I, I've used this thing on my car, like same exact problem. Okay. My car has this, is making this sound. It has this weird problem and the tire is weird when I hit the brakes, like what's going on. And it correctly diagnosed the, like my, my, rich, my rotors were warped probably without breaking. So I'm like, Oh, brought it into the shop and yep that's what they they confirmed that that's the problem and so you know using it as a as a diagnostic tool is pretty useful um it's just it's just again like i guess we have to ask more of the human users these days to be like just don't blindly trust this and only it i mean this is this is the main message to me is like it's only one source of information it may not be right but it could help you down your path to those solutions. So go talk to the mechanic afterwards before you jack up your car and start taking your tires off. <laughs> like it. <laughs> going a slightly different direction, but I think I want to get back to your technical points because as you are presenting those, one of the concerns I have is that they make it so easy to fine tune or to augment the model 
that any of us, I mean, I can go in right now and in under 10 minutes, create my own chat GPT. It's augmented with my own biases, with whatever I want. And I don't have those lists of four different things I should be doing and testing for adversarial, but I could go out and give it to people and be like, oh, use my chat GPT for $25 a month. You can use my version and it does one thing better than the other. But I haven't done any of those things, but they've made it so easy that literally almost anyone, yeah. it is drag and drop, it's yeah. that easy. It's not even, you have to know a little Python. It's not computer scientist stuff. Yeah. And that worries me, like, because I didn't do any of this. It's like, if I create a GPT mm -hmm. assistant, which is augmentation, I upload files, it's augmented, it's fine tuning, but I don't go back and do any of those verifications to see, like, does my new version of ChatGPT? I assume their big version, mine's so small, it doesn't change it really that much. Mm -hmm. So it probably doesn't matter. But like if I take a small language model and fine tune it, then whatever I do does have a bigger impact. Um, so I think there's a lot of trustworthy concerns. Like, as you were saying, if everyone creating models and we have models everywhere, how many people know to go through those steps? other than those in an engineering school who get taught these things, the rest of us don't. I, I have the same critique though, I hear the same critique of open source anything. Um, this, is, this was something that I often discuss with my advisor who preferred that we use tools like MATLAB maybe for doing our calculations because, or Stata, because these are like sort of industry vetted mm -hmm. software. And my pushback was I'm like, well, who's their user base? Like, how many people have ever tried this thing? I guarantee you that the Python version has been used by more people, by like mm -hmm. orders of magnitude more people because it's free and it's open source. To me, that's always the check of validity. If if it doesn't if it doesn't work, one of those 20 million people who used it would have probably found the bug and posted it on GitHub and been like, hey, this isn't working. And if it wasn't fixed, no one would use it anymore. They would just stop using it. And open source software just works because the users are the testers. We are the beta testers. And the more of us there are, the faster things get solved. And actually, you can solve it yourself and post your own code if you're good enough at figuring that out. You know, you can you can solve it. Okay, post it. We'll we'll pick your solution. And like I I I trust that because I know there are so many people who have used it that it must work. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't work. One of us would catch the bug. And I feel like we're kind of in a similar situation. This isn't open source even. I mean, like ChatGPT is not an open source um, product, but it is openly usable by pretty much everyone who has internet access now in the world, um, except for China, maybe. Um, but, so one billion people, no. Um, <laughs> but- um, And minus one billion. But like, I would say the, the so like the reaction that Gemini is getting, which is, you know, why is this not correct? Why, are, why does it show me these things that are logical? Um, that didn't happen so much with OpenAI's product when it came out because I feel like it wasn't engineered to do some of that. Um, and I don't hear as much gripe about it it not reflecting people's values properly or things like that. I, I hear a lot more about how it is re it is actually quite good at giving you the things that you want. Like it writes my code for me when I, when I ask it, you know, with a clear enough prompt. Um, so it's like, okay, this product must be working. Like if, if this many people are using it and we're not seeing it like calls for it to be shut down uh, or dramatically changed, then it, it we must be okay with it. So like at a certain point, there's sort of the crowd effect of like, I I accept this at its current level. I want it to be better. There are things we can do, but like, whereas the Gemini one the, seems like the public response right away was like, whoa, this thing is not ready for prime time. Like it's, there's just too many things that are that are not accurate and that's a problem. So I'm not gonna ask it to write my code even for me because maybe it's gonna mess that up. Like I don't trust it yet. Um, and I mean, those are the trust mechanisms in open source software, which is a weird thing. Like just the whole operating systems of, of Linux, like so many things run on Linux, which is a open source product. Like that's wild to me that that many, like corporations trust this that much, that just enough people are using it that we, we trust that it runs. Um, so I feel like a similar like crowd kind of 
effect is going on with these learned language models, and we're seeing the ones rise to the top that people are using more often because it, it's consistent enough that I, I trust it. Um, or did OpenAI yeah. break this up? <laughs> How did they go and create all these pictures in bad press for Google <laughs> that they want to snipe you more? Yeah. Well, it's kind of like you well, know, Gemini looking for problems. It just calls the ChatGPT API. <laughs> yeah. That's all it does, and it just sticks in other prompts. That we, um, yeah, sorry. we are yeah right at uh, the end of our discussion. Uh, I found this was really interesting. It sounds like um, yeah, kind of. There are levels of responsibility and layers of responsibility and accountability when we are thinking about these models. And you know, if it's something we're perhaps using in our own lives, we can be asking ourselves, like, what are my values? And perhaps how can I use these tools um, and, and use the settings that I want uh, to get the types of outputs that I want. Um, but then, you know, whether or not you're there at this point, once you're in a professional context, I'd really also challenge you to think about um, your values and responsibilities to the people that you are, are serving in your profession, whether you're a physician or, um, or an engineer building something, you know, whatever you're doing, um, and think about how those outputs might also uh, impact those secondary users as well. Um, but thanks, everyone. Uh, thank you for leading. Okay, I'm so, going to stop uh, the recording. What do we do? Do we...